we live? Yes, we are live. Yeah, now. we are live. Yep, we are live now. Hey, folks. Good afternoon. Good morning. Good evening. And I don't know which of the part of the world you are, but this is my journey for the serverless world. So, in the meanwhile, I'll be making sure that I'll be meeting a lot of people around the world, discussing about how APIs work, how the endpoints are being built, how endpoints are being generated, how a hash works, and all these kinds of serverless nonsense that I really want to really learn. So I'll be learning it through this journey. So this is my serverless journey. Hopefully you guys love it. And it's me, Vishwas Narayan, and it's Siddharth Singh, who will be on this episode one of this My Serverless Journey. And we both are just hustlers. Like, I'm just a uh, newbie to all these kind of a nonsense. Like, he's now a professional who is really working on all these kind of problem statements. So I've invited him. You know, we have a very strange story. You know, yes. we met <laughs> we met in a meetup. It's not even in a college. It's not even any place. Like, he's from a very, very far state. I'm from a very far state to him. And we met in a Microsoft Reactor meet. And we actually explored a lot. Thanks yes. to Bauxer, who was there in that session. And that was a three-day session. And we completely enjoyed that session. And I was like, damn. I found very great friends and Tejas is also one of them. And I'll be calling him for the IoT part, not the serverless part, because he's a kind of a guy who is more into the DIY IoT. and the hardware. Yeah. Sure, I think uh Siddharth, I think uh day before yesterday you gave me a lot of gyan, man. You know, we use this, <laughs> we use that, we were working on this, we are working on that, and all these kind of things. Like let's just let's just break it out into points and let's just say to the world like what is it all about and how is it going to be the new process of development and what is it going to be so you know let me just ask you like what's what's an architecture according to you like how is it just going to be like defined for you because i've seen engineers like uh, saying me like we with the block diagrams this that and things like that but what according to you is an architecture See, my view of architecture is quite different, you know, right? I see anything that we implemented in the computer. At the end, we took ideas from the real world. Imagine we are trying to do a building design. What do we see? Do we just go and design a 50-story building first? No, no. There will be a lot of workers working there. Imagine one of them just manages to do something wrong. And it's a 50-story building. Even if you do some bad thing at a level 25 floor, the full building might fall. So architecture is just an overall view of how your entire software is going to perform. See, it will consist of some base, okay, then some middleware, then some topware that you see in the world. So this is, as a design, you don't need to be worried so much about what is an architecture. Do I need to know it or not? Yes. If you're going to, into a software design, you should learn to understand architectures. And I'll tell you, as freaking as it sounds like it might frighten you, it's actually the other way around. If you learn around architectures, it becomes very easy to separate your code and which stages of learning will you go through to complete a software like cycle. This is my version of architecture. That that's how I see it. You know, like you know, I I do have this definition. It's just a block diagram to the non-tech people who are learners like me and you. Once upon a time, you know, we I I was uh, I'm very frank with you. I think probably a year before, probably yeah, probably like. And year before, I never knew what was uh, Spark's intuitive thought in data world until and unless we actually tried to install it. I think I had, had really worked on it for quite a while, like just for an hands-on shit and things like that. And like I, after we saw some problem statements, like, oh my God, Spark has some new impact on the industry right now. So... Yes. Like, it's it's a different story. Like, what's your story with first first job, and what's your story as a software engineer right now? Oh, right now, see, until two years ago, you know, I was interning, right? So for two years, I interned in machine learning. But anything as an intern that I got, it was an unpaid, and I was mentored by a really great guy, thanks to Dr. Rajesh, okay, Mr. Rajesh Jayapal. But when I, I really wanted to understand what's so different about what we learn in college, what we do in college projects, and in the industry, why they keep saying, you just talked about Spark, right? 
why use Spark? It has data frames. Pandas has data frames. There is a certain requirement, right? You will not get to learn about it until you face a real world problem. Where do you get your real world problems? There are yeah, some people. True. Yes, first thing. Either industries are built around real world problems or many startups, when you figure it out, you provide a solution, you build a startup. <clears throat> so here I'm just taking the experience of full software design, how it works, how each of the things that I've learned come together to build a solution that can solve a real world problem, right? Fibonacci numbers, anybody can do. Why? Why use Fibonacci numbers, right? You learned Java. Is it really to print hello world? No, right? At the end, <laughs> you're supposed to solve some problem. What is that problem that you can solve with all these tools you have learned? That's the meaning of this industry. The journey yeah. has been fun and I'm learning a lot. Yeah, you know, you, you told me about something about this dynamic programming. That is fine. Let's just go to that like a little later. But you really yeah. told me that one thing, you know, learning Spring Boot is no big deal. But when you start using it in the industry, like... You told me a lot of experience. You can share me that, those things also. And like, yeah, I know. Like, moreover, like, what's the difference that you find when you are implementing something in the industry? Right now, I know you are in a product team and you are now working on a lot of aspects. Like, we'll, we'll discuss about the Jenkins and what I faced uh, while I was learning Jenkins and using Jenkins. And what is my role right now? Like, I'm freelancing in some companies. I'm an, I, I was hired as an SD1. I'm hired as an SD1, but I hate the job because I'm very sorry, team. I really hate the job. I, I'm i confessing it <laughs> online. If you see it, I'm, I'm pretty damn sure that you guys know me that I'm going to go for my MS. That's for sure. Please, please don't sue him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, that's true. Like, I just want to ask you, like, what's the difference that you saw? Because you are interning interns are like something like babies like even if you do something wrong it doesn't matter until and unless it, you are uh, bound to do something on a production so how did this production journey really give you a lot and lot of insight right now see i'll be very very honest here okay you know i want to do and go into machine learning and deep learning eventually i have also going to do a ms right but first thing even and if I do deferred I... your admission from SFU. Keep yes. that in mind. <laughs> I, I do. I do. <laughs> please, please, if somebody sees from this, sees this from my company, please. <laughs> I'll, I'll still work diligently for you. Yeah, so, that's true. That's true. He's very yeah. diligent about it. Yeah. So the thing is, before I I was interning, right? It was an unpaid intern. So the guidance was mostly, I'll tell you. When I graduated from college and we met in MS Reactor meetup, we, I also attended a lot of meetups. I just attended it to see how industry functions. How is it different from what I have learned at college? So I, at beginning, I was confused like everybody else. Everybody else is confused. When I went there, I see industry professionals getting confused. They have been working for four years, but this is an entirely new technology for them. So it's okay to be confused. That's the first thing I'll just suggest. Else go there, put yourself out there. There are people like him, Vishwas, who do tech sessions, lives, will help you, okay? <laughs> Industry is not always like, they really help you up. And about my company, I'll tell you, I really got a good company. Subex, I work at Subex as a full stack software engineer. I got a really good company, see. Two years I was interning, right? My friends were working. They have been at the company. So I usually understand when you're just put in a role, Something expected out of you, right? You will do run these four technologies and you are done. You'll work in this one year, you'll do your own certification, then move on. To me, my company has offered me this chance, okay? Ki, you want to learn anything? Go ahead. They give me, gave me a project to develop a full product from scratch. Thanks. Thanks to that opportunity. Docker Compose and everything involved, right? Yes. So this full product... We are only two, three people. So it's like my child now. Okay. So obviously I am, I've entered industry trained for two, three months. Okay. So now this is where architecture comes into play. This software, if I'm given module by module and I'm just asked to work on one module, I, I used to get confused at the first, how do I, what does this module do at the end? How do I write this module? What's the purpose without a context? I have no idea how to implement a solution. 
it might seem very vague to you but that's how it works when you go there there's a there's like a lot of lot of code pre written okay you are supposed to use those modules for yourself but you have absolutely no idea what the product is doing imagine how you will integrate those you have no idea what components are meant to use for what imagine i give you a lot of, i take you a shop electronic shop i end up giving you everything this is ram this is chipware okay this you get irc2 resistors and all that and i then i asked you to design one electrical circuit and i will not even tell you what i am supposed to do what what is the product i am going to make now you are confused even if i tell you what it's going to do until now you have been doing a project in colleges you have no idea how a industry product is written okay clients have really really clients are like babies okay it's it's very different from real world where you can say why not just take input from the terminal you have to expect every scenario that can go wrong and you have to plan according to it okay the coding standard changes here you are working at this company for 2 years but what if you leave the next guy who comes he has to be able to understand that code read that code so it should be very readable not like every time you start using an variable name that's very comfortable to you someone comes and reads 6000 lines of code after 200 lines he's like oh god what is this i have no idea what this component is doing <laughs> oh, i have faced such situations okay <laughs> it's it's very difficult so understand all this i really needed to understand the architecture of my code i really took the time my team is a great my managers literally called me up for one hour gave me one hour each three four days then gave me kt sessions in person for one one hour each to teach me the full architecture of the component high level architecture then the product i'm supposed to work in they're giving me an internal knowledge okay you might think this is normal but actually i would be honest this is actually rare you have to show your own interest to learn these things so as you said docker right this is where stages of software life cycle comes okay until recently we'll go okay few years ago everybody has heard what a cycle model what a cycle model agile teams okay we are going to give updates every 6 months this is the new windows tech okay why these things are all related why devops a new term is has risen up now devops and devops is pretty old man you know devops is like pretty it has old. recently been used very much now and now it's shifting to a very different architecture now okay yeah, now we are even integrating it into ml ml and lot of automation ml, tools MLOps. Like mlops and not just that now a lot of automation tools are out there you choose a layer of architecture and you will find three open source tools one paid tool at least it's it's like that yeah how do you choose among yeah. these first how do you even realize which software is meant for what all this comes from architecture you have to understand this fact first if i'm using java what is meant by a back end language right what is meant by a front end language we end up saying java script is a back end and a front end language fine we have all heard it we have repeated what does it exactly mean right what is back why do a back end code why servers why can't we just do a monolithic architecture and leave it write a java code in one machine distribute it like windows right but right now we have serverless architectures central server architectures distributed systems why right because all these things are giving us more and more flexibility you can run a full google search engine on your phone and imagine the petabytes of data it uses right the data it goes through all the machine learning algorithms that distribute and and your phone has what 1 gigahertz processor 2 gb ram mm-hmm. right it's not right now even we say 8 gb ram and quad quad processor is it supposed to process petabytes of data in point what do you say 0.05 seconds no how is just flexibility you are getting because your mobile is just acting as a front end all the back end code that you are seeing that search results are coming from the back end through google servers this is the greatest advantage of enterprise application architecture the server architecture this is why we do it okay so client server model is also based on a real life model when you go to a restaurant there is a server waiting for you now imagine every guy is allowed to serve and every guy is allowed to just take whatever they want this is not how it works if there are 10 100 people moving inside the restaurant 
there will be at least two servers, three servers. Okay. Go to a domino shop. There will be three people taking your order. Behind that three people, there might be 10 people, 20 people walking to cook that dish. But to you, there are only three servers. And you are all clients. You move, you stand in a line. You place, request your order once. They take your request, pass it to the backend. This is the real world example. That's how it came in the computer. Imagine it like this. Anything that you paste in URL for your application layer, API calls, that server is received by those servers. It's taken to the back where it's the actual code is cooked. They'll prepare the dish. You do not have to know how the dish is being prepared. At the end, the only thing you care about is how it's presented to you. And the table in front of you is your presentation layer, front end code, right? So you just get a pizza. You have no idea how Domino's pizza is made. They keep the as recipe secret, and this is how we do it. The production code is secret. We build, and you don't know it. But this is called a very, very general idea, right? This is where all it yeah. all comes. The server layer. This is how the layer works. The server layer is the interface point. You go in. But there's an interface. You just can't go inside the kitchen and order, right? You have to order at a place. It's called the kiosk window. They have it open, right? That's the interf That's what we call an interface in the inter networking world, our software world also. This is where you are supposed to interact. So those, how do you interact? There are protocols. You just can't just go and say, go to a Domino's shop and ask for, give me half kg chicken. Okay, this is not how it works. <laughs> It's meant for something, and it will only answer to a certain request. These descriptions are what we mention in the APIs. You are given a requirement that this API, this kind of request will satisfy. If you give him this input, it will satisfy these results. You don't need to how. You just go and say, I want a Domino's pizza with some chicken nuggets on top of it. I might need extra cheese, OK? That's the parameter that you add in the function. You have no idea how it's built. You have no idea how it's implemented. You just say this. It goes to backend, any processing, anything, any data it requires. It needs butter. OK, it needs cheese. Not butter, it's a pizza. You need base. It acquires everything. That's like materials, right? Similarly, it's data that you require to function in software industry, right? It's called databases. You have the persistent storage there. You get your data from there. You cook it in the kitchen. Cook it in the software, what you're supposed to do with the data. Then someone requests you on the server, you send it back, send back the answer and served on your table. Done. This is how it works. But there can be way. Now, this is where a lot of things come in. We are seeing Kubernetes nowadays, right? You might think how this idea came up. OK, I'll just give it a many, very common example, delivery systems. A delivery system is operating in a city area, right? Let's go, we go to FedEx, which is a very famous packaging and del delivery system tool. A FedEx is, has a head branch in the city. But you j not just everybody, next time you want to go, you live in Yashantpur, you want to go to go for a package delivery, right? What will you do? Will, what will we all do? Will we just go to 30 kilometers drive and go to a head master node? No, obviously not. We'll go to the closest node available to us. These are called the worker nodes in Kubernetes. They have very similar structure. There's no difference. Masternode has some extra responsibilities. It's not like you can't go and give your job to Masternode. But at the end, every single node collects the packages they are supposed to collect, perform some work, and all supply report to the Masternode. OK, then one service comes in, collects every answer from the Masternode, and takes it back. And this is how it all works. This is how multiple node systems. There's supposed to be one master head branch. And now you think everything becomes easy when you think about nodes like this. See, Elastic, Elasticsearch, the auditing tool. Similarly, it has node architecture. All the logs from are like deliveries. You collect logs from each node, collect it on the one node. Anybody can kind of collect, the, collect it. It's, it's that easy. It's Kubernetes workload. You divide the workload on every node. See, is it that difficult to understand? This is why I, this is why I told you this architecture is important. Kubernetes is a very different technology than Elasticsearch tool. But at the end, they have follow a master node architecture. There's a master node, there's sub nodes. If you understand the node architecture, you know how work is being assigned. The only difference is what work each node does. And this is how 
it becomes very easy. You will know which interface is not doing problem. This is a way of looking into the industry, your code that you are writing. And if this is how you study and learn, you have a lot of opportunity to grow. Right. Now imagine, say Masternode. Today there is FedEx. Do you think if another service like Kubernetes is not is one service, right? Another service comes into play. Okay. How does it matter? It's a Masternode architecture. Imagine, is it only FedEx that's doing this way? No. DTDC does the same way. The company branding name changed, some functionality internal changed, but they still provide the delivery systems. Just because some functionality, some commands changed, it doesn't matter. They work the same way. They have to work the same way. Because that's the necessity for master node to work. So now you can understand that just because we change companies and technologies, we don't know to worry about whether you know one technology or not, if you know the architecture. You can just switch as easily. It, it, you will just know a master node is supposed to function this way. So I'll Google this way. At the end, everybody has to be honest. If you are doing Java, you are supposed to go to Stack Overflow. <laughs> you have to true, agree. That's true. that's true. If you are into machine learning, you will definitely Google every line. Okay. How to <laughs> form a statistical yes. graph using this for bar charts, binning. Eventually, you get used to it for basic functionality, but later on, you keep Googling. But the idea is what to Google and how you will get the idea what to Google. So there is like right now, there's a very, very over a high level architecture of software systems. This is what we say. Okay. This is where many, there's a difference. Okay. Enterprise language, general programming language. Okay, Java is a language, but why is it so, so famous in the enterprise? And why is .NET so famous? And why are these two technologies not being replaced at all? Even after 20 years, 25 years. It's very difficult. Right now, only Node.js is being coming up for server architecture, serverless architecture. But it's because of the enterprise architecture. What is an enterprise architecture? That's the thing you need to know. Cloud natives and all the things. Everything has to follow a certain protocol. You just can't just go and randomly send data to a link and imagine they'll give you an answer. Right. You have to flow a certain set of protocols. This is where the hiding details come in. The architecture layers hide the internal details. And that where you connect those arrows. Those are the interfaces. Right now, I am able to write just a front end in JavaScript. I just pass on a value through a data like JSON or XML object. It doesn't matter. You can pass it any way you like in the link using a GET request. As long as the other program is able to fetch it, it has data to work with it. Similarly, you can say, like, as I gave the example of pizza, does it really need to be, does the cheese need to be made by Domino's? No. Cheese can be made by Amul, okay? Or any other great brand that's out there. Milky Mist right now in Bangalore. Does it matter? Whoever makes it, we are fine. As long as that cheese is delivered at that doorstep, we know what to do with the cheese. But we need the cheese. We don't care who makes it. Similarly, front end creates some data user input, okay? Collects the data from every user, sends it back to an interface. Now, the people who are working in cheese are very specialized in that. They don't know how to build, how to make a domino pizza. They don't need to know. But they know how to cook cheese very well, how to eat cheese. They'll give you the cheese, deliver at doorstep. At the end, the product there, the people there, they receive the cheese as data. Now they'll do anything. If the cheese guy also wants a pizza, he'll still go and give the cheese to you. You will build that pizza and give it back to the cheese guy. It's as simple. But again, same thing. Interfaces will be different. If it's just because you're delivering it back door, doesn't mean you're supposed to go and get your pizza at back door. You will still need to place your adder on the server side. And this is how it works. You need to understand the interfaces and gateways in all of this. And internal code, this is where Java comes in. Why Java? Again, same thing. In here, databases are a very, very great, important part of your technology, which we don't often use in college projects. Right. Even if you do a user setting from dark theme, the persistent of that setting, that one setting, your English localization is made and saved in the database. Every setting of your software that you do on your front end, your YouTube page, your recommendation list, your music playlist, your likes, all are being sent to the backend database. 
and every time you open a single page it is being fetched in the back end from the database why databases imagine having files and now imagine how many hours of videos have you watched and how many clicks you liked how many videos are being recommended this is not small amount of data if we can't maintain this in files and imagine querying them what if i ask you oh vishwas you are what third year student now what did you watch in 10th july in your 10th standard 6th july <laughs> you would have no idea and imagine searching that in a file this is where the advantages of databases rise up it's to us finding a file like this oh my gosh databases super easy you just write a select query you get the data that data once you have it in your java code now this is what called a database layer it doesn't need to know what you are doing with the data it just stores the data done if you ask some kind of data for it it will give you the data this is called the database layer the data storage layer you might think cloud net cloud is very different right hell no sorry for my language but yeah it's the same you have to think about you need a platform to run your services right it's a pc yeah at the end you need one operating system to run your services first thing a base operating system at least a kernel you need right so when you are running general software on your system you use your own memory right you use your node hard disk and do it but your motherboard also acts as an interface you just don't know it because it's just rest on one computer right but if you can pass data to your ram here and now you have internet and ethernet port why can't you access the ram from some other system as long as there is a software that supports it right you just need memory you need to store your current data you opened a file that data needs to be stored does it really matter that it has to be on your own pc it never matters as long as you can access it it's fine wherever it's in the world that's the point of cloud you don't need a very heavy system at your home as long as you have a system that can access that resource with an internet connection it's fine it doesn't mean that the software doesn't need the resource the resource is there it's just that the resource is located on a very different cloud data warehouse it doesn't change much yes your os knows how to contact your ram that's exactly what a kernel is supposed to do but there are specialized kernel and cloud servers that are made to handle a lot of network requests to access those resources right those softwares are specialized you can't just open your microsoft edge and hope that it will connect connect to an amazon web service and just take the ram from there that's not how it works this microsoft edge service has to be on that cloud it's on your system it needs to be installed on that system where you want to access it similar architecture we copy we paste it on that pc and we just do nothing we make it accessible through a display screen like you are watching your youtube video okay you're watching your youtube video right now the video is already stored on the cloud you do not have the video you are not you are downloading chunks of it you do not have the full data all you are being shown is thumbnails yes that 50 data that it pulls from it and that's not even the video it's a thumbnail of the video when you click the link then the resource is being fetched you don't need to store the data you are investing no resource what you are investing the ram to open a edge browser and playing that video that's all even though there are petabytes zettabytes of videos out there on youtube you need one video and you access it from there but does the architecture change to the guy who wrote youtube no he still needs a database where the youtube is being stored the difference is the database is not installed on his own system there's a different system that has multiple hard disks okay there are rooms of hard disks connected there the database is installed there these are specialized databases made to handle these men this is where hadoop comes in querying 1000 hard disks at once is not an easy meager task even if it's ssd yes access, yeah. again same thing no master node architecture consider data nodes as them nodes and parallelly accessing and querying them each one of them this is where hadoop comes in this is called a distributed database system but at the end you understand it's a database its job doesn't change just because its scalability change doesn't mean its job changes at the end it's supposed to do that same thing 
it's supposed to store data and you're supposed to query it for data hmm. that's what you do so this is the advantage of knowing architecture you write one word database the technology can change from that 600 mb mysql database on your system to adobe hadoop that can store petabytes of data to you it's still a select query you don't really care what's there behind it you connect to database you access it and this is the advantages of architecture now you can see what this the real meaning of an architecture you write a database and now it's up to you what do you want to use there as long as you are you are able to fetch it similarly from that back end code it's not just database data place plus your enterprise logic now enterprise logic comes in which we also called as a business logic which is written in uh, this java usually but any language is fine okay as long as you're running an application server anything is fine now this layer it fetches data and writes your code like imagine you are searching something on youtube it's supposed to go and search in the database yes but now you want to sort it according to something some recommendations and everything who is writing all that logic there's somebody who's doing it if you click your settings button it changes your theme there is somebody writing that fetching logic from the database right it you are just using a mouse click and a select query is being written how something is writing all that code comes under the business logic it might sound very tech business logic nothing like that it's a normal fetch query that you write in java it's still the same you this is how it's supposed to be used you just go there write the same query the difference it where it is deployed right now that same java code you just to run your own old pc like which is 8 3 4 gigahertz 2 gigahertz dual core nowadays right four cores 2 gb ram fine imagine user like you me anybody who is watching this video all of these people are accessing the same resource okay now it's supposed to request an answer a copy of that data to everybody you need that kind of resource you do not work on your hard disk you work in ram so you need that kind of memory you your processor needs to be able to process okay this guy requested this write this logic for him write this logic for him and this is how it works so all this logic requires speed cycles cores processors so you need scalability of hardware where do you get all these ima one you can spend thousands of dollar build your own why there are systems already specialized for that called clouds you go there you acquire those processors you write your cores your requirements and they give you the hardware and they have specialized os running on it server oss that are made to access all of those resources at once and at the end you do not need to know all that why because to you it's like using windows operating system or linux operating system with what 64 gb ram 128 gb ram and 32 giga processor does it really matter to you at the end you will install java on it run the java code like you normally do and it will still work this logic will not change at all for you it's just where you are deploying it defines the capability of what your code can do it doesn't change as much as much as one might think okay the basic logic the idea behind it is the same so this is called the enterprise layer and these two form the back end of your code any heavy lifting of your code where handling a lot of data comes in that is all back end of your code because those systems have the resources then you come to the front end where your browser is being display, displayed okay here you are using javascript angular react to create front end pages even if you fetch data you fetch data for one page even if you're scrolling you are getting 100 or 10 tables or cards of instagram at once you load only 10 20 data at once in the front end because that's the capability of your cpu your mobile phone imagine i send you 1000 posts can you ram does you even have that memory to support 1000 posts no so when you are scrolling it's very neatly written code that goes and fetches that 10 more data this is the what we call pagination in concept so with using with tricking your mind that you are seeing all of it at once we, you are not we are making back end api calls but why are you not seeing those why are you not seeing a loading screen this is where comes in technology of asynchronous requests it sends requests without you knowing in the background it is there you just don't show intent the link and it secretly fetches data comes in 
builds the data in front of you. And the processors nowadays are so fast that you don't even notice that the data is being fetched and built right when you're scrolling in that speed. Four gigahertz. If you think about it, two gigahertz is also two billion instructions per second. These things require not more than thousands. So these operations are being performed at the scale of microseconds or less. Our eyes don't have the capability to catch it. That's how fast the systems are right now. So this is the trick we are being used. Now, when you have built all this system, imagine you are trying to go and set it up on a cloud. A lot of problems. How you will set up same Java code on 10 on production blocks. problems. Yes. Production problem. Now you want to give it to a thousand guys. Now the problem comes. 128 GB RAM is nothing, okay? You might need way more than that. 5 to LGB. One, this kind of handling. One terabytes one month, of RAM. RAM yes. Terabytes. yes. It can be. You're running Spark. Spark is an in-memory database modification tool, actually. It doesn't just store your data at it all. Sits on the memory. Simple as that. The it moment the you turn off your Exactly. The moment you turn off your PC, the data is gone. If the turn off the system on their the server system where Adobe Spark is located, all that RAM storage is gone. So all of that data is present on the RAM and it functions with them parallelly. So this is how those systems work. And then it gives you the result. And RAM yeah. is more than 10 times faster than anything that you can have on your system for persistent storage, even faster than SSDs. It's, it's about enterprise RAMs are 25 GBs per second kind of fast. Okay, they're, they're very fast. That's just yeah. way beyond you will use on your, even on your very good SSDs if you pay $30,000, $1,000, $2,000. So that operations are very fast. Those operations, they work almost in par with your, the processor speed that you acquire. That's all fine. This, why do we need it? Does it change much? No. We still do the data frame operation. It's because the data is so much that nobody is going to scroll up on your phone and wait for your loading screen. Nobody's ready to do that. You really imagine as a user, you go onto a site and it starts loading for three seconds. Now at this point, three seconds on a 4G network, you're not opening that site. Within three seconds, you'll just close the tab. <laughs> you don't care if they are processing petabytes of data, zettabytes of data, you don't care. All you want is that one sec under one second speed. To achieve this, we need Spark. To achieve this, we need Hadoop. Does it change the overall logic? No. Does it change the architecture? No. What it changes no. from MySQL usage to Adobe, Adobe Hadoop to process data. Hadoop is on, not like that. Okay. There are significant advantage to Spark. So what you do is all that select query, transforming data. Okay. Like oh, I want maximum of this, minimum of this, then map this table to other and cut paste these tables. All these operations you go and perform in the RAM because they're faster. This is where Spark comes in. And then that result is normally given to you like through an API interface on your Java code. Then you use it like you would use it normally. To run those kind of code, you need have heavier systems. So you use heavier systems. And this is where many technologies come in. Do you, would you like to write oh, 1,000 tables? Nobody wants to write 1,000 tables, dude. Create table 1,000 times. Nobody's ready to do it. Why should we do it? This is where Hibernate comes in one aspect of it. It manages your database and binds it to your code. This is, this is called ORM model here. This is all backend business, business logic. Now, what we do is to run all this, even if you're running a browser, what you're doing is there's a front end request. It goes to the back end, right? The thing is the front end code is being downloaded on your PC. That code exists on the back end. Every user gets its own copy of the front end. That front-end logic, the presentation layer I made for you, the design, you get a copy of it. Thousand users are access accessing YouTube. They all get that website drawing. You can download that. everybody needs to have the same experience. Nobody needs to have a lab. But like if we they are might, stream, they need to experience it in the same latency. Precisely. But at the end, yeah. you deploy the same code. Mm. Everybody downloads the same front-end code. Nobody downloads a different front-end code. Just because you are accessing YouTube with your own name and your own customizations, and I'm 
accessing the same YouTube page in white mode and you are accessing in dark mode. Just because a setting is changed doesn't mean the code is changed. The code is still the same. So you are downloading the same code. I am downloading the same code. Anybody who liked some bhajans and then some e-pops, then some k-pops, they are all getting the same page. The content is changing, but the code is still the same. So that means the full same code is being deployed. So all of this is run, running somewhere, right? Why do we, now I have already explained, why do we use server client architecture? Because it's easier to access the resources. Now we have a server, application server, and to serve a front end, to run JavaScript and HTML pages, you need a front end. Uh, you need a web server. Only a web server can process, get and post requests. There are different protocols. So an application server contains web servers inside yeah, it. Post all these methods are uh, only mostly there, honestly, only these two methods are used in API calls. You usually send mostly posts, to be honest. Get is also very you need authorization and now switching to authorize enterprise layer. When you go to enterprise, just because you have a link of an API call doesn't mean you should be able to call it. That way anybody can call it. Anybody can use your resource. Then what's the point of writing enterprise? I will go broke if I'm running that, that kind of service, Amazon and Google. Right. This is where authorization hey, comes you're in. You're actually lagging, man. You're actually lagging. What about now? Is it fine now? You're actually lagging behind. Wait, 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 wait. Yeah, it's fine now. It's fine now. Yes. Okay. So yeah, you now, can continue. even if you write the same code on your own PC, at the end, you do it on your own PC, you write a code, Java code, and you don't know Django frameworks you have heard, these many frameworks, you have model view controller frameworks, .NET code you write, you write JSP pages, Angular, React, and you use backend for Node. Does it really matter? No. Why? Because enterprise layer, Node.js is also supposed to fetch the data, do the same thing. The way of writing changes. Language doesn't matter as long as you understand the architecture. But when you deploy this code, it's, it needs to run somewhere, right? You wrote your code somewhere. You wrote it on Windows operating system, Linux operating system, that Apache Tomcat that you are running <laughs> or that Nginx server that you are running. It needs to run somewhere, right? It runs on an operating system. It's called a platform. In layman terms, the bigger term for in case of architecture is this is what we call a platform. Now. Over the years, the platforms have improved, right? If I want to run a, you earlier times, if I wanted to run a Linux code on my Windows machine, I couldn't. First, I need to download a virtual machine or install Linux on my system. There were two ways. You used to install a virtual machine, you used to install Linux on it, then you used to deploy your own code in that Linux. Then it was too heavy. Do you need full Linux to run that same code? No. Then came the concept of containers where you will just have the basic kernel of that Linux. And this is where Docker came in. It will give you all that system level calls, Linux specific calls. You will deploy the same application on the container now, and that container can be deployed anywhere. That container is like Java virtual machine or any like your Microsoft Edge browser. One is written for Windows or like Chrome, but the same Chrome also runs on Ubuntu. You, they are the same software. Same thing, Docker container is the same software. The interaction, you don't need to worry about it. Okay, how it will interact with the host operating system. You install a container, you deploy it in the container. Now, container could only be run on one system. But as I told you, I need a lot of resources. And I was, usually people used to deploy it manually at the very beginning, okay. Nobody wants to waste time on deployment. Dude, we already invested three months in agile development sprints. Now I don't have time to deploy 50 containers manually and write JSON script and configuration on each server. I don't want to do that. Okay. I don't want to go and write log fetching from every one of them. So this is where Kubernetes comes in. What Kubernetes, this is why it's called an orchestration tool. And Kubernetes is one more thing that Ubuntu has launched, Kubeflow. Cube. Same thing. Yeah. Yes. I think Rajesh sir has given one session that uh, anybody who wants to go there and see that, it's an amazing session. I think it was done in 2018 and I was there in that session. So, yeah. Yeah. So, it's a great thing. So, as you are seeing, 
the deployment part and the code written part the code written part hasn't changed that much the resources have changed still and because the same of the data fetch still, data process predict still remains the same it still makes the same things the thing is why do you need these, these tools now you deploy it in a container these container of thing do it yes because clients want the code faster they are paying you per hour for it your bill for 8 hours a day okay so and also as of business requirements if i can deliver a code in one month and my competitor can deliver the same code in two months i'll be the one getting that contract it's at the end it's all a business i have to satisfy business role so this this edge that comes in from the technology is significant and also earlier of one writing one software used to take two years now because of all this devops tools and this as the technology is moving forward we are wasting less time on writing all these json configurations you might think it's so tough to learn kubernetes try deploying 50 docker containers by yourself without using kubernetes you will realize it's going to take you more than a week what it's going to take you one day with kubernetes which might seem very long to you but it's less still six less six days less than the usual process six seven days less that's a lot and imagine the errors that might come in individual sections all of those errors are gone if by god if you get an error you're dead then you will be fixing error on 50 systems with kubernetes all of that <laughs> simplified it doesn't make errors it's a computer all of the configuration is auto written and the sequestration tool is complete now you want to collect logs right again you used to go individually and install logger system on those no need anymore we have elasticity fluentd fluentd pattern matches and collects logs and give it to elastic search elastic search same thing is can connect to a server service in the back end and put the logs in a database done it's it's that simple it's not that complicated thing and now because i know elastic search is a logger service and i attach a logger block diagram in the architecture you are not limited to elastic search anymore when i'm saying a container orchestration tool what i mean is a orchestration tool in the diagram a master worker notes any software that satisfies it that takes you less money use it the code logic won't change you still need to make the same api calls this logic is not changing so because you know the architecture you might know the same mean stack java stack node js stack and can just swap out one tool for the other and your code is still working without changing changing anything this is the significant advantages of architectures now it's like body diagrams when we you learn biology in school <laughs> first you would learn is digestive system your mouth yeah. your eyes right but as you advanced in your sciences in your grades and if you took majors and minors in biology you will start learning digestive system has some inbuilt systems that are supposed that's how it goes every block diagram has some inbuilt system how they function and this is what you do in certification you learn how those individual systems work and how you can manage them and if you plan a block diagram architecture to run a first you need to be a developer or an operations system or you can just deploy a software from one end to other and you will know exactly what you need to learn if you check each one of those boxes you will not end up learning same technologies two different technologies for doing the same job imagine you start you learn two databases what's the point this still, you will still be serving the same purpose you just wasted hours of it it sounds very silly when i say databases because everybody knows about databases nobody would learn mysql and postgres and oracle at the same time but when i say orchestration tools how many i can't name more than two and there are others so you might learn something else because of the hype without knowing what you're learning significantly wasting your resources this is where again architecture is helping you a lot you know exactly what you need to learn to deliver a product without wasting any of your time and this is how the server client serverless any architecture is that follows so you can see this is where spring boot came in because we had to write so many java configuration tools okay you had to write your own gsps you need to configure web xml okay 
to configure all that settings, how your server will be served, servlet settings. These things are being automated nowadays because of this framework called Spring Boot. At the end, the same code is being written underlying. It's same as saying, I used to write code in assembly. Now I write code in C. Then I used to write code in C++. You yeah. compile the code to object code, assembly code, and underlying it goes to machine code. Same thing. Just because it's a Spring Boot and the commands are, are built on top of it, it's for our use. At the end, Spring Boot will write the same code that we, we used to write. It will generate 10 classes for you, which you would have wasted your hours writing those 10 classes. So it's an ease of life scenario because I remember writing certain code and I recall how tough it used to be to connect to a backend RDBMS server using Java. It wasn't easy. And imagine I had to connect to thousand tables. Oh my God. I, I would dread the day. Now Spring Boot, it's, it's very easy. We'll build tools like Gradle. They just run an XML file and generate those classes for you that automatically create those tables for you within a Jiffy. And it's very easy to write an XML file and go and change a table's name in an XML file, then going and changing it in complete database and running a query. You don't even need to know databases. I'll, I'll tell, I can tell anybody that doesn't know database, this is the table you need to change, rename it to, he'll go and change one XML file and all that code logic will be written automatically. Within minutes, that table is changed and all that application logic is still preserved. Your code doesn't break. You don't face that those errors that you would eventually face if you go and manually change it. All the necessary connections, views, everything is updated automatically. All this logic is written in this framework. That's why we use frameworks. We would not use Spring Boot or Spring for our normal college project, but we would use it here because one code breaking bug really dissatisfies the client. This matters here. And this is what I have learned throughout in the industry and I hope I get to learn more. This is just, my journey has just started and this is my view with that internship and this software architectures. And I hope everybody at least takes something from this. Sure. You know, let's just go on with the theoretical part. You know, you told about why things are not fast in the world of computing, right? No, yes. I'll say it in a very quick span of time. You know, your CPU is just a form of um, silicon, which is made into a different form factor. Like there are okay. ionic interactions and all these kind of nonsense, which is just for the harder folks like me, because I'm an EC grad, not a CSE grad. So nowhere related to the <laughs> complete CSE nonsense that everybody talks about these days. So I'll say what happens in all these, like, you know, a CPU is a stack of transistor, which is logically wired. And somehow we have figured out ways in which to switch it more faster in the form of a transistor. So meanwhile, there are CPU was just a form factor, which had just ALU and a memory, but the caching came out into the picture because there was a need for a localized memory in your CPUs because everybody started using different languages and different codes were being like your Java uses a byte code. Why? Yes. It makes it makes the life more easier. So why? Because all the on system memory which was there. So meanwhile, you said about like RAM is much more faster, but trust me, nothing is faster because silicon just switches on, switches off at the same speed. So there's an hurt, there is a switching speed, there are like charge density and all these kind of nonsense. That's that's absolutely meant to be there for system. Like on the production, it can differ because every time when you fabricate a new transistor, no two transistors are still the same. So that's where. And let me just come back here. So L1 cache is something which sits on your CPU. And you know why even though L1 cache is fast, CPU is fast, your RAM is fast, but still we are facing the downfall in it. It's because of the DRAM refresh. Sorry for my typo. It's still the same old capacitor which charges out, stay, charges the code and there is a refresh command that goes in. So let me just come back here. So 
L1 cache is something which is like which sits on your CPU and what really makes it much more slower in terms of computation is the bus. A bus is a channel through which your charges flow. And no matter what, at any given point, it's just bits of data which is being transmitted. So because of this kind of a shitty, sorry for my language once again. So because of this kind of a nonsensical programming aspect that we have to really face, L1 cache is fast, CPU is fast, but the bus architecture makes it more of a difference. So when you think of like clock speed of a bus, that differs. L1 cache has a different clock. Your CPU has a different clock. So for a meanwhile, I would love to say, read this article. This is an amazing article, trust me. This is an absolutely an amazing article. So you guys can go on and check out like, what is this article all about to me if I'm in this development process? So, you know, he said about the ORA model in the software, right? Your ORA model is basically, you're not managing an application. You are basically prioritizing where your, where your application needs to be satisfied. A lot of error handling and things like that. That's right, right? You know, like you go to the production, you find a different error. You test for the local system, you find a different error. Because everybody is on a different platform. Everybody is on a different software base. So there's a lot of things where ORA model can really come up. So let's just go on with our slides. So, you know, all the things that Siddharth discussed, I'll just kept it in these form factor. Like I know this is very shabby. Sorry for my last minute work. You know, I have always told that I'm on the edge, but this is actually done some days, but like I didn't get a chance to scan it. So it's still the same thing. Hey, Siddharth, what do you think about this man? You know, this entire thing that I've shown up right now. Like I'll share that particular window for you. Whoa, it's here. Yep, it's perfect. What do you think about this, bro? See, again, same things, right? Yeah. Now, I th I hope after my lecture, people find it easier to understand that these whole block diagrams, they aren't as difficult. Each one of them contains a certain logic. And why it's like yeah. that? I I you find, know, to what, me, yeah. sorry, it, it's, 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 it makes sense. Why? Because I love seeing architectures more because imagine you give me code for this and I end up seeing 17,000 lines of code. I would not, not want to that, see that. It's more than that. It's more than that. I, I am just giving any number. 17,000 is yeah. a big number, right? Yeah, that's really right. If, if, yes. To, to, to be honest, it's more than 80,000 lines of total code. Okay. But now this block makes it all simple. I can just say that which code belongs to which section. I love this diagram. I hope. Let's go on with it. Yeah. yeah, you know, you know, it's all about the different endpoints that people have to experience this code about. Like, I I can say like there is a share market. No, there's a Twitter here which can also be accessed through your smartwatches, right? You know, anything can be. It can be on any form factor. It can be a laptop. It can be a computer which has gigabytes of RAM and gigabytes of graphics, but it needs to still deliver the same amount of computation because as you told, it has to just use an edge browser and it has to just utilize a RAM in order to access that memory and just put it on the screen. So similarly, you know, when you think of the fan out, async and all these kind of things which are popping up, I think Apache, I think you told about the Apache software, right? One Apache software, which is that one? Tomcat, the web server. Ah, that, that's it. Oh, sorry, the application server, yeah. That's an application. Yeah, I know, you know, when there are zookeepers, zookeepers are all for your database and all these kind of things. Like, how do you manage it? So zookeeper is an amazing tool. I, I never got a chance to work on it because uh, I'm not in the production environment. So I curse myself for that. Sorry for that. You know, this load balancer is something like, you know, uh, you know, this guy called as John Willis. I think I should share you this one. John Willis amazing person you know he still says that we still use a software based load balancer we still don't know what an ip based load balancer is all about and he's the author of uh, 
hands on devops and an amazing author and he's an amazing guy you know what do you think about the load balancers man what do you think about the load balancers these days like you know uber has a different story for that wait uber is a different story where waf function waf is there and afterwards there is a load balancer here and all these so uber has a different definition for load balancer see my understanding of load balancer i would just say is in that great for as but i'll let you in on what i think of it as of now to me while i was studying kubernetes i got a general idea that the term is self evident itself that it balances load but we will have to define load right at the end if it's given the same name it must be balancing some kind of load usually this is best evident on sales Amazon sale, Black Friday sale on West side. Mm-hmm. We also get there's Indian sales here. That everything is being sold for cheap. Imagine full year, Flipkart has certain number of visits. My system is supposed to handle only those many requests. But now suddenly you for those that big billion day scams exactly. happen. You know, Precisely. like uh, we used to literally hear that uh, Flipkart server is down because of a big billion day sale. precisely and and like this one what is that this cricket cricket world cup during that time that ticketing used to be like the server of this website is down because of the world world cup ticketing so many traffic they could not handle this they could not handle that and all well, this kind of nonsense yeah even everywhere and and then imagine i am and just saying what good old days that we had Yes. So a green crash that news was very very common but these days if the middle layer goes off that becomes a big news. Yes. This is very rare nowadays for actually these things to happen if it's deployed in cloud and kubernetes. Now this is where load balancing comes you can balance any kind of thing. Like what you need to do is you are given being select requests okay now you have 10 databases which copying containing the same code right? Okay, same database ten times repeated for persistency, but it needs to be fetched. Now, which database do I choose to choose to fetch? Imagine I get thousand requests and I end up cha- requesting the same database, same system for thousand requests. Wouldn't it be better if I send two fifty requests per database system? Right, they are all containing the same data. This is also kind of a load balancing here. That we manage requests. Okay, now imagine. i do a select request and then i want to update the table and they are all in the same system okay my database is in the same server my business logic in the same server but that business logic can access nine other databases that are on other systems but which is faster on this system right it should go and access this system only this is also a kind of load balancing right just because yeah. i getting a thousand request doesn't mean you should ma- give all the job to one person you ha- you are owning 10 10 people and you give all the work to one person although all all 10 of them are capable all all 10 of them are same capability this is one kind of load balancing that i understand okay and i think that might be the logic yeah. at the end it comes to what you are balancing what is the definition of load that keeps changing for each environment it might change for uber and it might change for other scenarios that is my understanding you know like this h activity from the hacker one like i know you are not a bug bounty thing and you're not into yeah, cyber security that. into that much but like you do you know like i actually track all these kind of bugs and all these you know still the xss works with the uh, kind of an uh, kubernetes is also still all of errors still but like grafana and proper authorization and all these kind of things comes up you know this grafana is an amazing thing No. Authorization uh, matters a lot. Yep, authorization. Well, you know, it matters a really, lot for enterprise applications. Yep, you know the this username enumeration via OpenSSH. You know this is one of the biggest error that you can ever see. Uh, there are SSL certificate, SSH certificates, SSL certificates which are given, SSL certificates which are given up, and SSH is something which we always do, right? this open terminal terminal things you know Thank like God. i always feel that like you know somewhere if you are exposing more of your public ip you are more easily vulnerable so that's why even like uh, 
most of the applications don't allow you to use some tools like nikto uh, sometimes nmap works sometimes doesn't work nmap is something which is very cool like i'll say what network is map mapper tool it comes with kali linux with kali linux no it it can be done on windows Any also system. but like nmap ucap and all ncap ucap and all these uh, Yes. Has to be put in. So, yep. Yeah, I know. The security, man. You know, I I don't know why the security has really caught my mind. And even John Willis also says that. Uh, what is this? John Willis is also preaching about this DevSecOps and like it's amazing, man. You know this bypass up, uh, bypass app server uh, proxy filter. You know, it's an it's it's the biggest vulnerability that even people find today. But, like, it's like. You know this SQL injection was supposed to be old by now, but it's still used. This SQL map is still being used, but I, 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 I thought it it became extinct. Never it becomes extinct. No, it can never become extinct because everything has an access to an API. Like you said about the JSON functions, right? Yes. JSON functions. Everything is a JSON function. Means everything somehow or the other has to pass through an SQL, or somehow has to be queried. Somehow has to be having an access so some canonical problems i still ask this problem to some of my podcast guests and they still say that there is still a lot to be <laughs> changed even though there is an access for the serverless computers today like typically it doesn't mean serverless <laughs> if you are being served and you are accessing through internet it has yeah. to there has to be a server mm-hmm. but it will definitely be a different architecture than the usual server yeah, server based computing server based computing Like yeah, I think I need to show you one more architecture. This one, I think Netflix. Yeah, I I think I opened this Netflix for you because of I just wanted to share you this Netflix architecture. You know this. Oh, I think I shared you a link in the morning, right? Do you remember that link? Caster. Caster. Oh yeah, openconnectnetflix.com. No, this is an amazing thing. Like, trust me. You know, there's a no DevOps culture, even though there's a DevOps team in the Netflix. Like, everybody has an access to the production. Like, you told about the Terraform. Like, Terraform is like literally making a lot of changes in terms of like making the architecture more cloud agnostic. Like, everybody gets an access to the production right now. Cloud is the new standard. and i hope I people understand it. I this can't it. <laughs> <laughs> i can't help it but like it's the it's the best way that you can really think about what's happening and how it's happening to be I honest think... cloud is the new standard yep it is it is service based yeah. computing and servers are being more famous now mm. and this is how the future is going to be i That's hope everybody it. understands that uh, you know this architecture that i'm showing right now right it's the architecture of any cloud storage like this is how typical it is like there is no uh, like i have not put in like any of like cliche wala software or something or some dependency or something i am just giving out this blunt view of like what is this architecture all about like seriously like this is how they exactly. are doing their like, chunks see again watchers. again you wrote cloud storage amazon s3 it's a storage at the end <laughs> so what what's its job to contain data So, if I need to store data, I can choose this service. Let's let's just go with Amazon's S3 storage. Get buckets, and now because there is a lot of data, again it's following a server client architecture. You request the data from the server there, the block server, and same thing goes again. Once you get the data, there are load balancers involved. How many requests yeah, are being made? A lot of things can be done, and see there's one application server there. So if you see it. that big uh, big block diagram of that storage is being broken into multiple small things as we are going forward with architectures as we are diving deeper they are being changed a bit for optimization first thing you do is solve a problem then you do optimize each block so now this is optimization of the storage block load balancing one client is there watcher chunker indexes which connects to the block server And earlier time we used to directly connect to the storage server Mm. now this this storage access is being very very optimized because why latency enterprise latency that's what you need everything needs to be fast now 
right even if you spend 20k on a phone you want it fast <laughs> that's the mentality of the client it needs to be fast that's true that's true i think we discussed a lot i think uh, i think we can have one more discussion probably next week or else tomorrow if the god permits us to have it but like tomorrow i'm packed man seriously packed tomorrow like seriously my i have actually today today actually today i'm packed <laughs> 8 a.m my day oh, starts like yeah oh, it's 8 a.m my day starts it's morning bro it's morning <laughs> Good morning, my dear friends. Good morning, morning dear. friends. So, if you guys see it next time, so think of all the hard work that we are doing. So, subscribe to our channels. So, this will be on our channel also. So, so do subscribe to this channel and come back to my channel and subscribe to my channel if you have subscribed to him also. <laughs> I think that's it, dude. I think we discuss a lot about different architecture. I'll be coming out with different case studies, and I'll be getting different guests from. Our, this serverless journey that i'm starting right now i think probably i'm going to have a lot of guests who are in the serverless world discuss a lot of devops and things like that blah 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 yeah. <laughs> to the world <laughs> i would, i i hope that my lecture could be boring i spoke at length for like 35 minutes non stop yeah. i hope people are able to follow it and actually get that fear out of architecture i think probably drawing an architecture is very simple but uh, under, under, uh, understanding the underlying complexity of it and making it less complex for your juniors is is, a, is very important so yes. if there are any bosses listening so please do keep in your mind we are human beings not a machine to understand everything in a one go so i think thank you so much brother this was thank amazing and i think we will uh, have another discussion so i'm going to end the broadcast stay in the blog stay in the blog it doesn't end